Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar. The purpose of this session is to provide you with an overview of Exposure Draft EDSR1, which proposes climate-related financial disclosure requirements for Australian entities. My name is Siobhan Hammond and I'm the Director of Sustainability Reporting at the AASB. I'm joined here today by my colleagues, Drs. Lachlan McDonald Kerr and Al Lee, who are both senior managers in the AASB sustainability reporting team. We will each provide you with details on dis different aspects of the exposure draft and other contextual information. However, before proceeding further with the presentation, we would just like to remind everyone that this presentation provides our personal views on the subject matter and does not necessarily represent the views of the AASB or its staff. This webinar is structured to cover the four thematic areas identified on this slide. First, we'll provide an overview of the international sustainability reporting landscape and the key features of IFRS sustainability disclosure standards. Next, we'll explain the AASB's role concerning climate-related financial disclosure requirements in Australia and explain the key details of the exposure draft EDSR1 including where the AASB is proposing modifications to the baseline of IFRS sustainability disclosure standards. Finally, we will provide a summary of the anticipated timeline to completion, including issuing of final standards. And with that, I will hand over to Lachlan, who will get us started today. Thanks, Siobhan. Sustainability reporting has been an established area for many years. However, there exists fragmentation in the various frameworks and standards developed in this domain. In a move to help create global consistency in November 2021, the IFRS Foundation, which has conventionally overseen the development of global accounting standards, established a new board known as the International Sustainability Standards Board, or ISSB for short. The ISSB seeks to simplify the global sustainability-related financial disclosure landscape by establishing a global baseline that reduces the complexity of having multiple sources of guidance while building on the established expertise and practices associated with existing frameworks and standards. The ISSB is a consolidation of several pre-existing standard setters and framework providers. These include the Climate Disclosure Standards Board and the Value Reporting Foundation, which govern the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board and the International Integrated Reporting Council. The ISSB is heavily influenced by TCFD recommendations which it took over monitoring responsibilities for in July 2023. However, the ISSB retains a separate scope of sustainability reporting to GRI standards, which are focused on impact or multi-stakeholder reporting. The ISSB is a sister board to the International Accounting Standards Board, or IASB, which issues global accounting standards, and both boards are governed by the IFRS Foundation. After its establishment in 2021, the ISSB commenced its work on developing standards to establish a global baseline of sustainability and climate-related financial disclosures for capital markets. The work of the ISSB culminated in the issuing of its first two IFRS sustainability disclosure standards in June 2023, being IFRS S1, General Requirements for Disclosure of Sustainability-Related Financial Information, and IFRS S2, Climate-Related Disclosures. IFRS S1 sets out the general requirements for a for-profit entity to disclose information about its material sustainability related risks and opportunities that are useful to investors in making decisions related to providing resources to that company. IFRS S2 is the first topic specific standard to emerge from the ISSB and it sets out the requirements for a for-profit entity to disclose information about its climate related financial risks and opportunities while building on the requirements described in IFRS S1. Both IFRS S1 and IFRS S2 require an entity to disclose information in four key content areas, governance, strategy, risk management, as well as metrics and targets. These four content care areas are consistent with and build on TCFD recommendations and will be familiar to many entities who already report climate-related financial disclosures under these recommendations. So what is the AASB's role in Australia's financial disclosure and reporting landscape? 
The AASB is an independent Australian Government agency established under the Australian Securities and Investment Commission Act of 2001. We have a board that consists of 14 members from a variety of backgrounds and with technical expertise across the for-profit, not-for-profit and academic sectors. The AASB is responsible for developing, issuing and maintaining principle-based Australian accounting and external reporting standards. These standards apply to certain entities under Australian law and the AASB aims to contribute to stakeholder confidence in the Australian economy by enhancing the consistency and quality of reporting by entities. While the AASB's work has conventionally been focused on accounting standards and external reporting guidance, recently our remit has expanded to include the development of sustainability reporting standards. As part of the Australian Government's commitment to introducing internationally aligned mandatory climate-related financial reporting requirements for certain entities, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission Act of 2001 was recently amended to explicitly empower the AASB with the ability to develop sustainability reporting standards. The background information provided over the preceding slides really takes us to EDSR1, which proposes climate-related financial disclosure requirements for Australian entities. The AASB has developed the proposals in EDSR1 using IFRS S1 and IFRS S2 as a baseline with modifications to address Australian specific requirements and respond to stakeholder feedback. EDSR1 consists of three draft Australian sustainability reporting standards referred to as ASRS in the shorthand. The first proposed standard is draft ASRS1 which proposes the general requirements for the disclosure of climate-related financial information. The standard has been developed using IFRS S1 as a baseline, but with a scope limitation to apply only to climate-related financial disclosure. As noted earlier, IFRS S1 is designed to be applied to the reporting of all sustainability-related financial disclosures and is not limited to climate-related financial disclosures. The AASB is proposing a scope limitation because the imminent disclosure requirements that the Australian Government is considering imposing, as described in Treasury's most recent policy statement, are related to climate-related financial risks and opportunities and not broader sustainability-related financial reporting or multi-stakeholder reporting. Furthermore, such an approach allows the AASB to address immediate demands for climate-related financial reporting first and consider the approach to broader sustainability reporting matters in Australia at a later date. The second proposed standard is draft ASRS2, which proposes the core requirements for disclosure of climate-related financial information. This standard has been developed using IFRS S2 as a baseline with modifications to address Australian-specific requirements and respond to stakeholder feedback. We will further describe proposed amendments to IFRS S1 and IFRS S2 later in this presentation. The third and final proposed standard is draft ASRS 101. This standard has been developed as a standalone service standard that can be updated periodically to list the most up-to-date versions of any non-legislative documents published in Australia and any foreign documents referenced in the suite of standards. This proposed approach would allow the AASB to efficiently update any external document references in the suite of standards without re-exposing the standards themselves and help to ensure consistency with our approach towards setting accounting standards. EDSR1 was published for public comment on the 23rd of October 2023 and is available for comment until the 1st of March 2024. Stakeholders are encouraged to provide their views on the proposals in EDSR1 throughout this comment period by submitting a comment letter, completing an online survey or attending one of the AASB's outreach events as advertised on our website. Feel free to pause the video here and scan the QR code on this slide for more details. I want to hand over to my colleague Al, who will provide further details on EDSR1. Thanks, Lachlan. Having considered some of the high-level details concerning EDSR1, we will now focus on more of the substantive content of the proposed standards. The scope of draft ASRS1 and draft ASRS2 is focused on the climate-related financial risks and opportunities related to the climate change. Climate-related risks may be either physical or transition in their nature. Physical risks can be either event-driven, for example, storms, floods, drought, or heat waves, or arise from longer-term shifts in climatic patterns, 
for example, change in precipitation and temperature. Transition risks refer to risks that arise from efforts to transition to a lower carbon economy that have financial implications for an entity. For example, increased operating costs or asset impairment due to new or amended climate-related regulations. Climate-related opportunities refers to the potential positive effects of climate change for an entity. For example, efficiencies arising from early adoption of low emission energy sources. Notably, the objective of draft ASRS 1 and draft ASRS 2 is to require an entity to disclose information about its climate related financial risks and opportunities that is useful to primary users of general purpose financial reports in making decisions relating to providing resources to the entity. To achieve this objective, the draft standards require a for-profit entity to disclose material information about climate-related risks and opportunities that could reasonably be expected to affect the entity's cash flows, access to finance, or cost of capital over the short, medium, or long term. Non-for-profit entities also need to disclose material information about their climate-related risks and opportunities that could reasonably be expected to affect the entity's ability to further its objectives over the short, medium, or long term. So what does the architecture of the standards look like? As mentioned earlier, the four core content areas of the EFIS sustainability disclosure standards align with the TCFD recommendations, as shown on the slides. Disclosure related to governance aim to enable users of GPFR to understand the governance process, controls, and procedures used to monitor, manage, and oversee climate-related financial risk and opportunities. This includes information about the reporting entities' governance bodies concerning climate-related financial risk and opportunities, all management roles in this process. Moving to the next core content area, the objective of disclosure related to strategy is to enable users of GPFR to understand an entity's strategy for managing its climate-related financial risk and opportunities. This includes disclosures of each of the climate-related financial risks and opportunities the entity has identified, the anticipated effects of this risk and opportunities on the entity's business model, their response to addressing this risk and opportunities, and the resilience of the organization's strategy in the context of climate scenario analysis. Moving to the next core content area, the objective of the disclosure related to risk management is to enable users of GPFR to understand the process by which climate-related financial risk and opportunities are identified, assessed, prioritized, and monitored. These disclosures include information on how the entity's approach to managing climate-related risk is or is not integrated into the entity's overall risk management process, as well as how the entities prioritize climate-related financial risk relative to other types of risk. Finally, the last pillar in the model is metrics and targets. And the objective of these disclosures is to enable users of GPFR to understand the entity's performance in relation to its climate-related financial risk and, and opportunities, including progress toward any targets the entity has set or is required to meet by law or regulation. These disclosures include information, for example, on the dollar value and percentage of assets or business activities vulnerable to climate-related financial risks, whether and how climate-related considerations are factored into executive remuneration, and the price entity used to assess the cost of its greenhouse gas emissions. So this is really a high-level overview of the standards architecture and some of the disclosures may be provided for the four core content areas.
now that we have a better understanding of some of the disclosures required in the standard, it is important to consider some of the key modifications to EFSS1 and EFSS2 base 1 that the WSB is proposing and the rationale behind this. The current slides list eight of the key, but not the only proposed modifications to EFSS1 and EFSS2 base 1. The first proposed amendment relates to the development of sector neutral climate related financial disclosure requirements. The WSB received strong stakeholder demands for sector neutral disclosure requirements to ensure consistency with the WSB's approach to accounting standards. Furthermore, we recognize that in the proposal outlined in the Australian government recent policy statement and exposure draft legislation on climate related financial disclosures, some non for profit entities may be pulled into reporting due to being a material part of a large company's value chain. Therefore, the WSB is proposing changes that clarify how climate related financial disclosure requirements apply within a not for profit context. The second proposed amendment relates to replacing conceptual framework contents in EFSS1 and EFSS2 with references to where that content is located. Stakeholder feedback to the IWSB exposure drafts highlighted significant concerns about including and making enforceable aspects of the conceptual frameworks for financial reporting when conceptual frameworks are non-mandatory and therefore not enforceable within the context of accounting standards and entities' financial statements. The WSB agreed with this feedback and is proposing amendments to the baseline of EFS S1 and S2 which would help to return the non-mandatory status of conceptual frameworks. The third proposed amendment relates to removing the requirements for entity to use industry-based metrics presented in the SASB standard. Stakeholder feedback to the IWSB exposure trial of standard highlighted significant concerns surrounding requirements to consider and use industry-based metrics or guidance that had not been sufficiently internationalized or been through a proper due process in Australia. Consequently, the WSB is proposing to omit the requirement to use external source of guidance, such as SASB standards, until the content has been comprehensively internationalized and subject to due process in Australia. Importantly, it must be noted that this proposal does not prohibit any entity from using SASB standards or any other industry-based metrics on a voluntary basis. Instead, it removes the requirements to have them considered or used and therefore reduces the complexity of compliance for organizations. The next proposed amendment relates to adding the requirements to disclose where an entity assesses it has no material climate financial risk and opportunities. The EFIS sustainability disclosure standards do not include a requirement to make disclosures where an entity determines it has no material climate related financial risk and opportunity. Consistent with the Australian government's recent policy statements and exposure draft legislation, the WSB is proposing an entity to be required to make an explicit disclosure where it determines it has no material climate related risk and opportunities to help provide useful information to users. The next proposed amendment relates to refining the requirements related to climate resilience. EFA's sustainability disclosure standards require climate scenario analysis, but do not specify the number or temperature requirements for assessing the climate resilience of the entity. Consistent with the Australian government's recent policy statement and the exposure drop legislation, the WSB is proposing that entity make a resilient assessment against at least two possible future states, one of which must be consistent with the most ambitious global temperature goals set in the Climate Change Act 2022, that is 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels. By specifying the minimum number of scenarios and the lower temperature scenario to assess against, this proposed chain aims to ensure improved consistency and comparability across entities.
The next proposed amendment relates to preference for methodologies in anger scheme legislation to be applied for greenhouse gas emission measurement. Domestic stakeholder feedback to the IWSB exposure draft and the treasury consultations indicated strong demand for anger scheme legislation to be prioritized ahead of the global greenhouse gas protocol in Australia. This is because the greenhouse gas measurement methodology in anger scheme legislation are much more sophisticated and provide better accuracy and comparability. Consistent with the Australian government's recent policy statement and the exposure draft legislation, the WSB is proposing that when measuring greenhouse gas emissions, methodologies in anger scheme legislations are prioritized whenever practicable. Where not practicable, entity would be permitted to use a greenhouse gas protocol. The next proposed amendment relates to adding a requirement for entities covered by the mandatory reporting regime to provide additional information related to the scope to market-based greenhouse gas emissions and associated transition reliefs. The Australian government's policy statements indicate that certain entities would be required to make scope to market-based emissions disclosure because of strong demand from investors. The policy statement further clarifies that such a requirement would only be in effect should an entity be required to disclose its market-based scope to greenhouse gas emissions applying anger scheme legislation. Consequently, the WSB is proposing adding a disclosure requirement for entities required by the Corporations Act to apply ASRS standards to make market-based greenhouse gas emissions disclosure. However, this may be further amended to better align with the revised view in the policy statement. To help alleviate the burden of this requirement, the WSB is also proposing transition relief for the first three reporting periods. The final proposed amendment on the slides introduces additional relief concerning the disclosure of Scope 3 greenhouse gas emissions. Stakeholder feedback to the IWSB exposure draft on FSS2 and the Treasury's earlier consultations highlights issues around the timeliness of Scope 3 greenhouse gas emission information, as that information relies upon reporting by all entities within a value chain. Consistent with the Australian government's recent policy statement and exposure draft legislation, the WSB is proposing that where it is not practicable to disclose its current reporting period scope 3 greenhouse gas emissions, an entity is permitted to disclose its prior period scope 3 greenhouse gas emission in the current reporting period. This is in addition to the relief already provided in the standard for scope 3 greenhouse gas emissions disclosures in the first reporting period. The proposed amendments aim to strike a balance between domestic requirements and the stakeholders' needs while returning alignment with international baseline for climate-related financial reporting. For issuing a standard, one common question is whether any non-authoritative guidance will be provided alongside it. The IWSB has already developed substantial non-authoritative content for IFRS S1 and IFRS S2, including application guidance, illustrative guidance, and illustrative examples, which accompany the respective standards. The IWSB also intends to provide additional guidance and supporting materials on IFRS S1 and S2 through the recently established transition implementation groups. Considering that the IWSB has already developed substantial resources to support IFRS S1 and S2, and that the Australian equivalents are aligned to their international counterparts, the WSB has made the preliminary decision to defer work on developing Australian equivalent guidance until the Australian standards have been finalised. This approach allows the WSB to use stakeholder feedback from ADSR1 to determine which areas of the Australian equivalent climate-related disclosure requirements require additional guidance to support implementation. Any guidance will be designed to support the consistent application of the Australian requirements and enhance the comparability of information. And like our approach to accounting standards, 
this content will be made non-mandatory in nature. I will now hand back to Siobhan to talk about issues beyond the scope of the ED and the next steps. Thank you, Al. The AASB is particularly keen to hear from the broadest range of stakeholders possible on matters related to EDSR1. We appreciate that there will be diverse views on the proposed requirements, and we are interested in hearing stakeholders' views on proposed key design considerations. Nonetheless, it is important to acknowledge that there will be a range of matters that stakeholders will likely consider very important but which fall outside the scope of the AASB's work. Some of the issues that are beyond the scope of our work are identified on this slide and include the scope of entities required to comply with the standards, the legislative date for commencement of compliance with the standards, issues of legal liability and director responsibilities, including legal issues related to making forward-looking statements, and the level and type of assurance. Issues such as these will be addressed by the Australian Government policy, with the Australian Government's current policy position outlined in the policy statement and supporting exposure draft legislation, which was released for public consultation on the 12th of January. This suite of consultation documents outlining the Australian Government's policy position and exposure draft legislation is open for comment until the 9th of February. So where to from here? To close out this presentation, the final point to consider are the next steps in this project. EDSR1 was published for comment on the 23rd of October, 2023. And since then, AASB staff have been engaged in education on the ED to better inform stakeholders of the proposed climate-related financial disclosure requirements and respond to queries relating to the proposals in the ED. AASB staff will continue public engagements into 2024. However, our focus will now shift from education to outreach. The AASB intends to host outreach events in 17 locations throughout Australia, including every capital city, to obtain stakeholder feedback on the proposals in EDSR1. From the opening of the public comment period until its closure on the 1st of March, 2024, staff will continually analyze stakeholder feedback to identify common themes and any areas of concern identified by stakeholders. After the conclusion of the comment period, staff will present a summary of stakeholder feedback and recommendations based on that feedback to the board for deliberation over whether any changes to the proposals require further public comment. That is, depending on the nature of the changes needed to the proposals in the ED, if any, it may be necessary to publish an updated proposal document for public comment. At the time we published EDSR1 for public comment, we expected that this process would be completed and standards finalised for use by the 1st of July, 2024. However, it is important to note that our timeline depends on the passage of amendments to the Corporations Act and ASIC Act, and to the nature and extent of the feedback to EDSR1 and whether re-exposure would be required. So that's all from our end. Thank you for listening along and we hope you found the information presented here useful. We look forward to seeing you at our forthcoming outreach events.